I'm moderating the next panel, and I'm pretty excited about this because this is something not much keeps me up at night um, now that my kids are finished with college almost. Um, uh, but AI keeps me up at night. And part of the reason it keeps me up at night is uh, I feel like I've ridden this rodeo before, right? I've been doing this uh, for longer than I care to, uh, longer than I'll admit, let's put it that way. Um, and I feel like I've gone through two really bit disruptive cycles um, in my career. The first one, and this is, this is going to make me sound like the fossil I am, uh, was the advent of desktop publishing, right? This, this was to an entire cohort of my colleagues um, in magazines, this was uh, an existential threat. And it turned out, eh, it's not really an existential threat. It is if you're sitting in a room with a linotype and a paste-up board, but now you're just going to need to learn new skills. And so that wasn't disrupted. The second thing was the advent of the in internet. And uh, I'm not going to belabor any points about uh, what it has done to, to media. I look at AI the same way. Um, at heart, I'm a writer. You know, left to my own devices, that's what I do. And when I see some of the stuff that generative AI can create, it makes me a little bit nervous. I know that the human touch and the ingenuity and the idea, the fact that I didn't, you know, one of a writer's jobs is to know what people didn't know they wanted to read about. It's also an editor's job. Um, this seems a little bit scarier to me. Um, and I was at, as I mentioned earlier, I was at South by Southwest in, um, in early March. And everything, every single discussion turned into a discussion about AI. And most of the people there, very smart people, were saying, it's OK. Um, you know, don't, don't lose your head. You're not going to lose your job. And so we came up with the panel, this panel topic, which was, don't worry, AI isn't coming to steal your job. And it turns out that just now, Ramon told me, yes, <laughs> you should be worried. It may very well be coming to steal your job. So when I said that I had uh, speakers who wanted, who were looking for provocative questions, um, the guy uh, that came to mind immediately was uh, Ramon and, and Ryan as well. So we're just going to jump right into this about, um, you know, AI is not coming to replace you, or is it? And uh, please welcome um, my, my panel members, Ramon Soto, who is the SVP and Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Northwell Health, and Ryan Younger, who is VP and Head of Marketing at Virtual Health. Guys, welcome to the stage. OK, so we've got a room full of uh, uh, medical marketers, pharma marketers, wellness marketers. Uh, and we have a room full of agency folks, uh, half full of agency folks. And we're all kind of wondering what's going to happen to our jobs. So you know, at first, I thought, no, we're not going to lose our jobs. Now you say, Ramon, that we actually might. So do you want to put a finer point on yeah. that? I'm just being glib, but can you put a finer point on that? So first of all, Steve, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to the panel. And um, thank you for the opportunity to share with this group. I want to pre-apologize. I'm just recovering from a cold, so a little bit of a raspy voice. Uh, the reality is this is such a sexy topic. I thought I'd talk in my raspy voice for today. Um, you know. Artificial intelligence, I'm, I'm like Steve, I, I have almost as much gray hair as him. And um, I uh, almost missed the internet. Ryan's got a great head of hair too, so. <laughs> he does too, but he's younger than us. Um, and uh, I remember um, when uh, I went to college and we were still doing papers and typewriters and uh, this internet thing was really interesting. Um, but I didn't know that it was like a real thing uh, super early in my career, obviously. And then I remember um, social media. And uh, I was in graduate school, 2006, I had my Facebook account. And I, I remember recalling, oh, isn't this cute? I can communicate with my classmates. Uh, and now look back to where Facebook is and social media as a category, uh, reinventing itself. AI is one of those things that the, the analogy that I would probably offer you up is think what happened with uh, automation to manufacturing, right? So the robot came out, um, really thinking through workflows, this concept of divisional labor and what can a machine do better than a human uh, on a faster basis. 
Uh, it, is, um, it is exactly the same analogy with the knowledge worker, right? So I look at this less as um, a disruptive threat and more as an opportunity. You know, we're in this full employment market. We actually need more workers. We need productivity. Um, but if you miss the curve here, you don't upskill what you do. And if you don't use AI, if you don't use chat GPT daily and really exercise those muscles, you're not going to be in a position to use the productivity tools that naturally come out of it. Ryan, wh where do you come down up on, on this? Uh, picking up on that exact idea, you know, I subscribe to that theory that we've heard a lot about that AI is not going to replace all of us, but it's going to replace the people that don't use AI. And I thought the examples of the internet and social media and how transformational they were and how much we use them as marketers is really key. Um, it's a technology, so it's a, it's a technology that still at this point requires people intervention and you know, it allows us to scale things at um, amounts we probably haven't seen before and we're just at the beginning. So I don't think we know all the ways that it's going to change and transform, uh, but it's going to be significant. If you look at uh, certain job types or job functions, uh, which ones uh, which ones do you think are most likely to be disrupted? Um, I, I'd say um, I think you have to think about it as lower value added work versus higher value added work. So we're already seeing a change in our group. We um, we have about 150 people in our marketing department. About half of those work in an internal agency. We produce thousands of pieces of material for our health system. We treat six million New Yorkers. We have 85,000 employees. And um, our copywriters now use um, AI to do the first versioning of content. You literally just feed it. You get out a first draft. It's pretty interesting and it's pretty good, but it's not quite there. So our copywriters are now turning into copy editors Right, so I'm not eliminating jobs. I'm actually, uh, they're able to produce more content to feed a beast. And if you haven't noticed in healthcare, um, you know, the, there's not, there's a challenge in terms of affording the costs of healthcare. I'm not getting more people. So the people I have, I need to be more productive. And that's how we're, we're uh, leveraging this productivity opportunity. Ryan, are you seeing the same thing um, at, at, uh, at your shop? Yeah, I think people are able to produce a lot more content. And, you know, the content process is not completely automated from start to finish. So we would su subscribe to the same idea that it's going to be good at, at creating brainstorming ideas, subject lines for email marketing, uh, first drafts. But there's a lot of human intervention to go through the nuances, to create some of that emotional in intelligence and nuance, and how we even customize it. Um, for different audiences. I think, I think people can work at a higher level. They can produce more, can create those efficiencies. Um, and to Ramon's point, we're not, getting, we're not getting new budget positions, but we are being asked to do more. So that's where it's going to help us. I think we, we have to embrace it as a technology and as something that really helps us. There's no going back. One of the... Um... <clears throat> One of the topics that I heard at South by Southwest was uh, about AI and the human touch. And because this is, we're talking about medicine and healthcare here, um, we all know how important it is. Uh, oftentimes the, the, the actual physical touch of an HCP. Um, are, there, are there roles, are there functions that, um, the that that touch, that human element can be completely removed from? Um, I'll, I'll I'll answer your question in a slightly different way. The, um, I was talking to our head neurologist in our health system. And the guy does um, incredible brain surgery. You know, this literally is a gifted individual. <clears throat> and he was lamenting how much time he has to spend um, writing up his notes and inputting it into the electronic medical record. <clears throat> and... Um, Google's working on this, Microsoft's working on this, um, Epic is working on this. Um, there's a company that Northwell invested in called Playback Health that what it does is uh, it records the conversation between the doctor and the patient and uses natural language processing to automatically extract the notes and put it into the MR. 
So what he gives him back is a thing that's incredibly precious, and it's time. So he can spend more time with the patient. And then it turns what's significantly a, um, a point of contention, the patient not having enough time with the doctor, um, into a delight. And then, by the way, the patient gets a copy of the conversation just had with the doctor because they can't remember all the discharge notes and all the things that the doctor is trying to communicate to the patient. So I think this is one of those things where, you know, we can, it, has, it holds great promise to provide better health. Think of all the things that we can now see that we can't see that's buried in data through this learning process, this iterative process of scanning data. Um, we can do it at lower cost, that's the promise, and we can enhance the experience at the same time. It's, um, you know, there's a bit of a trifecta. There are very few things that are going to really transform healthcare. This is like one of those things that if we don't get on board with it, <clears throat> it's going to pass us by. And by the way, if you're not leading it, you're going to be the victim of it because somebody else is going to lead and you're going to see the new Facebook pop up to the top or the new Google pop up to, from a technology standpoint. I think in addition to it being more time with the patient, the physician and the healthcare provider likes it because it's more quality time. You know, when it's listening in and it's taking in that they don't have to type out those notes, you know, after hours when they want to be doing something else, um, it saves them time. But it's also the interaction I think they get to have with the patient. You know, if you've been to the doctor's office, you might see them over here on their board. They're typing into this computer. They've got to input everything into that electronic medical record that might be my patient right there, and I'm sort of talking. I think if it's doing that structured data, now I can have that interaction with you. I can connect with you at a much more personal level, and I can learn things that I wouldn't have. So I think it, I think it brings some of the old school element back, that touch, that feel, um, and it's, it's, again, really, really helpful. And we've seen it also help clinician in other ways. Um, we talked a little bit about you know, the impact it has on radiology. And so um, we have a, something called GI Genius, and it helps detect the polyps in a colonoscopy, and it aids the physician in, in what they can find, and it, and it obviously helps you as a person if they find things that they might not have found or they find them earlier. And again, it's, it's not replacing them. It's not saying the physician doesn't have a role, that we're just gonna use AI to diagnose and, and treat somebody, but it gives them a, a better sense um, a better line of vision into the field, and again, pick up some things that they may not have. So it's a huge improvement. So when we spoke last week in advance of this, of this talk, um, I asked about applications within your given shops. And Ramon, you mentioned uh, that, that copywriters were uh, using it and becoming more like copy editors. Um, and Ryan, you mentioned uh, a little bit about how you're using it for analytics. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I think the analytics portion is enormous for how we've used it. And again, I'm going to stay optimistic and speak about it for the better. Um, with analytics, we've done a lot of health propensity modeling. And so what we want to do is identify people that might be at higher risk for heart disease, higher risk for cancer, and motivate them to take action, to take a health risk ass assessment, to talk to their doctor, to read more information, to get engaged in that topic and try to kind of bring them along in a journey. And so if it helps identify people at risk at an earlier time and we have ways then to activate people, <clears throat> the analytics is really helping us um, get them uh, into better treatment options. And so it, it, can, it can look through such complex information so fast that you're able to stratify people, you're able to segment people. Um, and again, I think that's a huge benefit. And I think <clears throat> in our industry, everyone here, we've been using it for a long time in digital marketing, right? That's, that's sort of what search engine marketing is based on at Google. It's automatic, automatically optimizing to the creative that converts best and, and optimizing there. So, you know, that's an AI technology that we've been using all a long time. Yeah, search is AI. And, um, you know, it, when, you, when, when the conversation becomes a little bit overheated, it's often helpful to remind people that, um, you know, look, we've been using this technology for, for, for a long time already. It's just, um, it's just come into different, uh, been available. It's now being made available uh, in the form of different tools. Um, but, you know, 
Well, first of all, I just want to remind everybody that if you've got questions for our panelists, shoot them our way via Slido, and uh, they'll come up on this pad here, and I'll be able to answer the question. Um, one of the things that we were also talking about last week was a little bit about um, just how overheated this is. Um, there was a story in the Financial Times uh, on Monday that, that talked, uh, talked about one of the founders of um, one of the, the sort of the visionaries who founded AI was saying that the rush of capital into the market was causing it to overheat and getting maybe uh, maybe a certain amount of snake oil was starting to, to slide in there. Or a certain amount of like, that's just a bad application. And when I think back to around 2000, I think of pets.com. Remember that? It was like, you get a, the sock puppet and you get a 50 pound bag of dog food sent to your house. And it was like, was that really the best application of this technology? And then we had the dot com bubble. Are we looking at another bubble here? Is it, is it overheating and it's going to reset? Or do you think that, you know, yeah, it's just full speed ahead? Uh, so I think um, <clears throat> we, you're, um, any innovation is going to cause disruption. And then in that disruption, you're going to have ideas about how to take advantage of the disruption. <clears throat> and this is a very classic cycle. Um, the... Um, What's interesting about that is the U.S. market is uh, incredibly good at matching um, ideas to capital. So funding these new ideas to disrupt the market. <clears throat> so you're seeing us enter the wild, wild west phase. And that's exciting. I think it's great. Uh, it does lead to some frothiness. I, I think that is going to be inevitable. Um, but you're going to see uh, ideas float to the top. You're going to see a correction. You're going to see a consolidation phase. Those are, those are classic cycles that, that happen with the internet. Um, it happens with um, new ideas. You can go back to um, Edison versus Tesla and which was going to win out, AC or DC electricity. And um, capital found the best product to commercialize and bring to the markets. So um, I think the more ideas, the better. This is so transformative, um, and we need really fresh new thinking. And the, uh, the innovation is based off of you know, data pre-2020, chat GPT-4. Um, you know, they're already talking about chat GPT-7. I was listening to a podcast yesterday about it. Um, it's going to drive, I think, more ideas into the market, and then we'll see that settling out phase. Right. I mean, I think the infusion of capital is going to be enormous. Some of the estimates that I've read recently are that it's a $200 billion industry about in the United States right now. And over the next eight years, um, they're predicting that going up to about one, $1.3 trillion. So lots of, lots of entrants. I mean, you can't talk to a, a, a company out there that is not highlighting its AI capabilities right now. And I think a lot of it will shake out. I think that if it's just a product and it's using buzzwords, it, you know, it, 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 might not, it might not pass the long-term test. But for the companies that are really developing platforms that are going to really integrate the technology into lasting performance, um, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of uh, continued capability. And I think one of the keys will be, too, are people able to create trust, you know, not just talk about the technology, but how do brands use that to create more trust with their customers. And again, the ones that do that, I see as the winners, the ones that don't are going to get left behind in this process during this consolidation. The questions are starting to come fast and furious, so why don't we take a few. Um, can you talk more about health propensity analysis and how do you avoid false positives and hallucinations? Um, so I'll, maybe I'll start. The... Um we're just starting to look at this. <clears throat> you know, there's uh, too much clinical data that's locked away in the EMR right now that doesn't get used, <clears throat> doesn't get aggregated. It's, um, it is, uh, it really is at the detriment of consumers. So I think to the extent that we can uh, work to analyze it and identify intervention opportunities that are going to improve the outcomes of individuals, the better we are. The, I had this conversation about false positives with a um, radiologist. 
And uh, he was taking the other side of the equation. Um, you know, the, the product that Ryan was talking about in terms of skim, image scanning, machines can do it better than the human eye. You can pick up these anomalies that are incredibly small um, and are more accurate than doctors. But the reality is you need the human intervention to step in to check the results because uh, there's hidden bias in the data. And if you let those, that hidden bias um, really drive the interaction with the patient, you're gonna set yourself up for a, a catastrophe. You know, we didn't talk about the nefarious part of AI, but you know, the, the flip side of the opportunity is the downside. And imagine a doctor who just takes all the, the EMR data, the lab data, the, the, um, the patient data that he has, comes out with a uh, diagnosis and never interacts with the patient. That's the downside. You need to have an individual in the loop. The question is at what point in the loop to drive the most value with the tool. I would just add quickly that, you know, we have to test and learn. Um, in, our, in our models that we've implemented over the last four years, every time we've run a model and then run a campaign, um, we've, we, we've done a um, sort of an equity analysis and if there's underrepresented groups that don't come out the way that we thought, that they're, they're not a large enough part of the audience, then we overrepresent them in the campaign. So it's not, you know, we're not just taking the AI solution and running with it. We're, we're, we're taking an analytical look at it and, you know, making some modifications where, where we need to. And I think, I think it's that continued process is, is probably the best check on it. Yeah, I mean, it's important to remember that AI is based on algorithms. Algorithms are based on data, and many data sets, especially in uh, healthcare, are flawed, right, and have inherent biases that, uh, that we need to, to mitigate against. So um, there's some really good uh, tactical questions here, I think, uh, are really smart. How has AI changed your talent and hiring strategy and also employee performance management strategy? Uh, on the hiring side, the, um, we're looking at um, people with different skills. Like two years ago, I was never looking at anybody who could, um, who, who had a knowledge base on structuring a prompt for an AI query. You know, that was, that was like, a, a, that was a, an exotic uh, field. Now it's, you want to have the best structured content going into what you're trying to find out of the AI come out of the, the back end. And it's a skill set. There are actually job categories that are um, being focused on this. The, the other piece that we're looking for uh, more than ever is attitudinal. So is it, does this individual have an inquisitive mindset? And are they going to be an early adopter of new tools and techniques? Because uh, this is going to change everything. So we need people who are not going to be afraid of this thing, but who are going to embrace that change. And I'll pause there. Yeah, I think it's impacting a lot of the hiring process. And we think of it a lot, you know, on our team, we don't think of, a, we don't have a digital marketing team because everybody's a digital marketer. You know, that was a, a name, I think, that, that came about. But to me, it's, it's not that relevant anymore because you have to use it. And I think AI is similar but we look for a similar idea. Um, it's the curious mindset. So AI is not going to automatically solve everything. You want somebody that is thinking critically as they're using it. And that's a, that's a trait that we've valued for a long time and will continue to. But, but again, it's, it's somebody that maybe takes more risk as an earlier adapter. And I think that's maybe one of the changes in, in who we're looking for. Can I have one more comment? Yeah, the, uh, you know, the other thing we're trying to do is upskill skills. So we put together a um, task force um, of individuals who are trying to figure out what's coming next and how do we adopt and how do we build on that experimental mindset? What are the things that we should be testing and learning and bringing new ideas to us? <clears throat> one of them actually uncovered a product which is pretty interesting. I don't remember the name, but I can provide it back to you guys afterwards. But it's uh, AI applied to music and advertising. And it actually will create custom scores for you so that you don't have to pay um, the licensing fees on music for any of your advertising. <clears throat> it's absolutely fascinating. I hadn't thought of that as a category. That was 
that this was applicable to. Um, but it's been quite fortuitous for us, and we've used it in three campaigns already. Fascinating, and, and there's the terrifying part because my one of my graduating seniors is a music major. So, <laughs> well, he better be studying AI, and <laughs> he's got a bright future. Yeah, you got wrong, wrong kid, but um, <clears throat> perhaps one of the other two. Um, there's another really good tactical question: uh, Are you investing in solutions from small emerging AI companies, or are you investing more building your own solutions in house? Ryan, you want to start with that one? We're currently investing, I think, um, in sort of this build versus buy. And, and there are aspects of us building our own, but I don't think we have the same level of expertise as some of the companies that have formed and are 100% focused on this. So we're taking advantage of that best of breeds approach. Um, I think we are continuing to work on our own aspects of it, you know, with building our own chatbots and, and things that can solve internal questions. But... Uh, I'd say a little bit more biased towards the, the larger platforms and the groups that have been focused on this with much more investment than us for a longer period of time. Yeah, on the Northwell side, we, um, we have a venture arm that um, they run about a $100 million fund and they've invested in an AI aggregator company called Ascertain. Um, Ascertain partners with uh, a bunch of third-party organizations to incubate AI-driven concepts in healthcare. <clears throat> both on the clinical side and the administrative side. We use that as an early adopter strategy to get a first peek at some of the emerging trends and then potentially adopt it within our health system. Great. Um, a, a very specific question for uh, about marketing. What's the most likely way that large language models will improve personalized marketing messages for physicians, payers, and patients? I'll, I'll go first on this one. This one actually is the most exciting thing we're working on. Um, we're, um, if you've ever gone to a health system website, um, you haven't gone there to peruse. You usually go there with intention. And that intention is typically to find a doctor. If you've ever done a physician search on a health systems website, it's terrible. It is the worst process ever. Um, and uh, we're using AI to uh, um, completely reimagine it. So this is where we're taking the data that's locked away in the electronic medical record, <clears throat> analyzing it, um, having the consumer a answer a few query questions that then present out this personalized information about patients like them and the doctors that they see. So automatically you get to this interesting community that is a high, you go from non-personalized at all to highly personalized interactions and this confidence building. Um, we worked with IDEO to develop the concept. Um, it's been in market for about two years now. We, about 10% of our search is covered through this, this process. We're looking at scaling it up and rolling it out probably in the next 18 months. Ryan, how do you see it becoming, uh, using the, the, the tools to make more personalized messages? Um, you know, using it in a lot of different ways, but I think in, in how we understand our audiences, how we tie messaging to those segmented audiences um, is a key part of the process. And, you know, again, it's, it's a combination of the the AI technology and the human intervention in how we're doing that. Um, I, I, I did think the search was a really good example. I think that, again, it, you can provide so much data on the taxonomy of, of all the ways that people might be looking for physicians, but also in much more common ways than we think of. You know, if, if you're looking for a doctor, you're looking for an ENT, you're not looking for an otolaryngologist. You know, things like that, that we can democratize the information I think is going to be really helpful. So uh, we're down to just a couple of minutes left. Um, so, and I've got more questions than we have time, which is always a good problem to have. Um, but this one is a specific question about health data. Uh, in terms of predictive analytics, what risks do you see in patient privacy in setting their expectations for their own health data? Ryan? 
plenty of risk. I think that, A, we've got to educate people about how this works. And, you know, I think there's some, some, some trepidation and it's, it's warranted. Um, we did a study recently about robotic assisted surgery, you know, something that we're promoting. We assume that as a higher end technology, people would mm -hmm. <coughs> gravitate toward it. And there was a lot of questions about what does that mean? Is the robot doing the surgery as opposed to knowing that it was assisted to help the person do that better? And when we were looking at AI, I think there's some of the same questions. People are certainly worried about their privacy. You're putting it into this open space and answering a lot of information. And that's why the governance is going to be so helpful. We've got to really figure out the safeguards around that. There's a, a lot to navigate. Um, there's bias. There's ethical questions about what to do. So it's probably a, a longer answer. But on a short side, yeah, I would agree that there's a lot going on there that people sure, should have concerns about, but also that we're working hard on, you know, especially in healthcare. I mean, that, that is the most important thing that we do. It's creating that trust with the end consumer, and it's, 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 you've got to guard that privacy. So there's a ton of emphasis on it. Ramon? Yeah, just super briefly, I, you know, the warning for me is um, you're, you're seeing the Wild West in all this experimentation. <clears throat> where um, you also have this regulatory regime that is not caught up to the experimentation. So what is PHI? Um, you know, is the result of an ag algorithm that's based on a large population? Um, do have consumers opted in to have their data used for that? Um, what's the federal government gonna require in the future? How is that gonna restrict your use of data? Um, how do you actually get the individual to opt into this? Um, can you, substitute anonymized data for it. You know, there's a thousand questions and it's, I, I think it's gonna get, uh, that particular piece is gonna get ugly before it gets better uh, for the benefit of consumers. Well, uh, we're out of time. Uh, I still have more questions. So uh, if you guys uh, hang around a little bit, maybe the people who asked the questions that we didn't get to, including one about uh, emergency NYC. Um, uh, uh, maybe it's a good one. That's a lot of questions. So, anyway, um, Ramon Ryan, thank you very much. This was yeah, great. a pleasure. Really appreciate thank it. you so thank much. You, appreciate it. Pleasure.